Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Rowe, and today I will be talking to you about microbes that infect the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. This slide shows how integrated the circulatory system is with the lymphatic system. There are no known microbiota that live in the lymphatic system or the cardiovascular system. So if you have a microbe that is in the bloodstream, whatever the microbe is, you're going to put a suffix on the end of it. For example, if you have a virus in the bloodstream, you have viremia, the presence of viruses. If you have fungemia, you have the presence of fungus. And if you have bacteremia, you have the presence of bacteria. Bacteremia is also referred to as septicemia. Septicemia is a serious bloodstream infection, which is also called blood poisoning. Make sure you understand that the poisoning is not due to a toxin. This blood poisoning is in reference to the bacteria that is in the blood. And the bacteria is an organism, not a toxin. A serious complication to septicemia is called sepsis. This occurs when bacteria grow and flourish in the bloodstream. Toxins from the organism can cause tissue damage. So septicemia is a broad category and you can have a low septicemia versus high septicemia. High septicemia will be considered sepsis. That is a more severe form of septicemia. This damage from sepsis may cause septic shock. Septic shock is the cascading events that occur through the immune response and this will result in decreased blood pressure and poor organ function. These are the symptoms of sepsis. Shivering, extreme pain and discomfort, clammy or sweaty skin, confusion, shortness of breath, and elevated heart rate. In most cases of septic shock or sepsis, the microbe is introduced into the blood via an IV line or a surgical procedure. Bacteremia is evenly divided into gram-positive and gram-negative. If you were to isolate the blood from a person that has bacteremia, there would be a 50% chance that a gram-positive bacteria would cause it such as Staphylococcus aureus, and then there will be a 50% chance that a gram-negative uh, bacteria can cause it. The gram-negative bacteria can be destroyed by the immune system. When it is destroyed, the cell will release lipid A. Lipid A is part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. In this picture below, we're looking at the structure of the cell wall of gram-negative. Gram-negative have a cell membrane and exterior to that it will have a small peptidoglycan layer, several layers th thick, whereas the gram-positive might have 40 layers of, of the peptidoglycan. Outside of the peptidoglycan for a gram-negative, you have a thin membrane. 
attached to this membrane you have a lipopolysaccharide and that lipopolysaccharide is composed of lipid A so when your immune system destroys or a drug destroys a gram negative bacteria the gram negative will release lipid A this lipid A is called the endotoxin it is going to stimulate a massive inflammatory response that will be mediated by these chemical messengers called cytokines this gram negative infection that has been destroyed and now we have released the endotoxin is going to lead to a drastic drop in blood pressure a condition known as endotoxic shock because the endotoxin is interacting with the immune system in the slide below in the picture we're looking at several examples of gram-negative bacteria bacteremia that is caused by gram-positive bacteria are going to be treated a little differently by the body first of all the composition of the cell wall of gram positive is different than gram negative like I mentioned before gram positive have multiple peptidoglycan layers up to 40 layers in this picture we're looking at the thick wall that is exterior to the cell membrane of the gram positive bacteria gram-positive bacteria can instigate a similar cascade of events when fragments of the cell wall are released into the blood in the picture we're looking at several examples of gram-positive bacteria now we're going to look at tissue infections we just concluded talking about bloodstream infections caused by bacteria now we're going to look at what happens when bacteria infect the tissue tissue that is involved in the cardiovascular system would be tissue that makes up the blood vessels or tissue that make up make up the heart the chambers of the heart or the actual valves of the heart so the lining of the heart the tissue that lines the chamber is the endocardium this can become infected if it come, becomes infected it is called endocarditis so in this picture the shiny portion that is attached to the uh, papillary muscle is called the coordinate tendine and it is attached to the valve the valve can become infected further in the picture the chamber is lined by this shiny type tissue that is the endocardium this image shows the four chamber heart the little string like structures are going to pull the valves the valves can become infected and everything that lines all the chamber that you see in this picture the four chambers will be lined by the endocardium also clinical symptoms of endocarditis fever fatigue joint pain edema of the feet leg and abdomen weakness anemia abnormal heartbeat and sometimes symptoms similar to those of a myocardial infarction endocarditis most often refers to an infection of the valves of the heart there are going to be two variations of this infection that we will discuss an acute endocarditis and subacute endocarditis the difference is 
Acute occurs very rapidly and subacute occurs very slowly. Endocarditis is most often caused by Staphylococcus aureus. But it can also be caused by Streptococcus pyogens, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria gonorrhea, and other forms of Streptococcus like the Streptococcus viridens. This slide reminds us that Streptococcus has many groups based on the sugar that makes up the cell wall or it can be further divided into groups based on a protein that's in the cell wall. The Lansfield classification scheme versus just the proteins that make group A be subdivided into many many different types. Both of these bacteria that we will discuss, Streptococcus pneumoniae versus pyogens, they both are gram-positive bacteria. Streptococcus pneumoniae is most commonly seen as two coccus joined together to form a diplococcus. So it is so prevalently seen in Streptococcus pneumoniae that it used to be called diplococcus. Within the category of diplococcus there, was, there were 92 different serial types and the picture that is included in this slide you see the diplococcus uh, shaped streptococcus bacteria. Streptococcus pneumoniae and streptococcus pyogens normally colonize the mouth and the pharynx but it can cause a disease if it enters into the bloodstream. So normally streptococcus colonizes the mouth. It's associated with cavities. It is attached to the biofilm that is stuck to the teeth in your mouth. Sometimes this bacteria can infect the pharynx. If so, you have pharyngitis. Untreated pharyngitis can cause acute endocarditis, but this is very rare. Acute endocarditis usually begins suddenly with a high fever, fast heart rate, fatigue, and rapid and extensive heart valve damage. This disease most often is the result of an overwhelming bloodstream challenge with bacteria because of a surgery or a traumatic injury. These bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus can then colonize the valve forming a biofilm which ultimately impedes the function. So through some type of surgery, the skin bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus is introduced into the bloodstream. It then circulates through the cardiovascular system and then it attaches to the heart valve where it will form a biofilm and grow. This biofilm ultimately will impede the function of that valve. Biofilm is a network of bacteria all clumped together. Pieces of this biofilm can break off and create a blockage to vital organs. It can also provide a constant source of bloodstream infection called sepsis. So in the picture below you see that the biofilm has grown on this surface and periodically pieces will detach, break loose, and get into the bloodstream, which will cause sepsis. The biofilm can also lead to a misguided immune attack 
against the valve or the heart muscle. If the misguided attack occurs, this is called rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever is when the immune system is tricked into attacking its own self. Acute endocarditis mostly affects healthy hearts. Now we will look at subacute endocarditis. This one is slow at progression. You will have a mild fever, a moderately fast heart rate, weight loss, sweating, and anemia. Pre-existing heart disease or birth defects such as a congenital malformation can cause a subacute endocarditis. One classical example of the etiology of subacute endocarditis is Streptococcus viridens. It is the most common culprit in causing this infection because the heart is abnormal it increases the chance of you getting subacute endocarditis so therefore if you have surgery or minor abrasions in the mouth you will increase the risk of getting subacute endocarditis if you have birth defects of the heart Bacteria of low pathogenicity, often originating in the oral cavity, can cause subacute endocarditis. And these are several examples that can cause it. Minor disruptions of skin or mucous membrane, for example in the mouth, can introduce bacteria into the bloodstream. This can lead to subacute endocarditis, especially if you have heart defects. This slide, taken from the National Institutes of Health database, talks about how to get subacute endocarditis versus acute endocarditis. Now we are going to talk about blood and blood cell infections. Common symptoms of malaria are fever, headache, sweating, muscle pain, and fatigue. You get malaria from this protozoa. This protozoa is called plasmodium. It is the causative agent of malaria. In the picture, we're looking at a red blood cell and this protozoa is inside of the red blood cell. This protozoa is called plasmodium. Malaria is endemic throughout the tropics and subtropics. It is a protozoan disease that threatens 40% of the world's population every year. Mosquitoes act as the vector to spread this disease. Only the female of the genus Anopheles can transmit plasmodium. She is the one that requires a blood meal. Therefore, she will pick up the protozoan from her blood meal. In this slide, we're looking at three genus of mosquito. The Anopheles transmits malaria. Aedes 
will transmit these viruses versus Culex will transmit those viruses. Protozoan development is divided into two distinct phases. Asexual will occur in the human where sexual will occur in the mosquito. This is how the plasmodium causes the disease called pathogenicity. The mosquito is going to inject plasmodium into the bloodstream. The stage of the life cycle of plasmodium that is injected is the sporozoite. The sporozoite is going to travel through the bloodstream until it reaches the liver where it is going to penetrate a liver cell. The hepatocyte is infected by the sporozoite. The sporozoite then becomes a merozoite. These merozoites mature inside of the hepatocyte, the liver cell. Then it is released from the liver cell into the bloodstream. Now these merozoites will circulate alongside of erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. They will then infect the red blood cell. They will get inside of the red blood cell and become a trophozoite. In this image, they're pointing at two trophozoites that are inside of an infected red blood cell. The trophozoite develops into a schizozoint. This is a cell which contains many many merozoites and the picture I have highlighted by a bracket the schizozoite cell and inside you see maybe 20 merozoites. The schizozoint cell releases the merozoite into the bloodstream that reinfects the red blood cells. This table 18.1 summarizes this entire process. This entire process occurs in the human and it is referred to as the asexual reproduction of the life cycle of plasmodium. Lysis of red blood cells occur every two to three days. Some merozoites develop into male where some of them develop into females. The male gametophytes are different from the female gametophytes. They're both in your blood. They developed into male or female inside of your blood. Now if a mosquito bites you and sucks some of your blood it will be infected with male gametophytes or female gametophytes. Then inside of the mosquito sex will occur, the union of gametes will occur, and that is referred to as sexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction occurs in humans which will produce a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte. And then sexual reproduction occurs in the mosquito. An unaffected mosquito can become infected in this manner. Plasmodium is put into a category based on its inability to move. That category is a phylum called Apocomplexian. Apocomplexians is a category, is a phylum of Protista. And any protozoan that can't move is placed into this category. Other protozoans that have a flagella can move. Some protozoans have cilia. Some protozoans have false feet called pseudopods. Plasmodium can't move. So it is in, placed into the phylum of apocomplexians. 
in this slide I'm illustrating four types plasmodium falciparum this is going to cause severe cerebral malaria we will then talk about plasmodium vivax it will cause chronic malaria then we'll talk about plasmodium oval which will cause a mild form of malaria and we'll finish with and talk about plasmodium malariae which will cause severe malaria the first one is plasmodium falciparum hemolysis the rupturing of the red blood cell is going to make you anemic so hemolytic anemia will result from the lysis of these red blood cells the red blood cells are going to lyse because they're infected with plasmodium organ enlargement and rupture due to cellular debris that accumulates in the spleen liver brain and kidney can occur if it affects the brain this is very dangerous for the patient this is why this is why plasmodium falciparum is referred to as causing cerebral malaria small blood vessels in the brain become obst obstructed due to red blood cells adhering to blood vessel walls the decrease in oxygen in the brain can cause tissue damage coma and death plasmodium vivax results in chronic malaria and it is subject to relapses infected liver cells harbor dormant protozoans for up to five years plasmodium malariae causes severe malaria plasmodium oval causes mild malaria we will now look at infections of white blood cells white blood cells are leukocytes so we just talked about infecting red blood cells now what can infect white blood cells infectious mononucleosis affects the lymphatic system it can be caused by a number of bacteria or viruses the vast majority of the cases are caused by a virus called Epstein-Barr virus the Epstein-Barr virus is a member of the herpes virus family which is a DNA based virus a notable sign is sudden leukocytosis the rupturing of the white blood cells consisting initially of infecting just B cells and then later T cells fatigue is a hallmark symptom of this disease these are some classical symptoms of mono more than 90 percent of the world's population is infected with Epstein-Barr virus in general the virus causes no noticeable symptoms time of infection time of life when you are exposed to this virus for the first time seems to matter infection during the teen years seems to result in the disease infections before this or after this is usually asymptomatic direct oral contact and contamination with saliva are the principal modes of transmission this table 18.8 .8 summarizes mononucleosis 
Now we're going to look at internal bleeding and fever. Internal bleeding is referred to as hemorrhagic fever. Hemorrhagic fever is caused by a number of agents that affect the blood and lymphatics. These agents or viruses cause extreme fever. Some are even accompanied with the rupturing of these fragile capillaries. The presence of RNA envelope viruses in the bloodstream will cause capillary fragility and this, this will disrupt the blood clotting system which leads to a various degree of pathology including death. One classical example of hemorrhagic fever and its cause was the Ebola virus. Ebola can be transmitted via the improper handling of imported monkeys. This slide shows the, the CDC's data of the outbreaks of this virus. Notice around 2014 you saw a spike in the presence of Ebola and hemorrhagic fever. Table 18.9 shows several examples of viruses that cause hemorrhagic fever. Now we will look at fevers that are not accompanied by the bleeding of the capillaries. Non-hemorrhagic fever is an infectious disease that results in high fever but without the capillary fragility that leads to the bleeding symptoms. All diseases in this section are caused by bacteria. Cat scratch fever is the first one that we will discuss. About 40% of cats carry this bacterial infection and they never show any signs of the illness. This bacteria genus is Bartonella. Cats get it from a flea bite and then it will give the infection to a human. When the human has this infection they will have a fever, headache, poor appetite and exhaustion. Prevention of this disease is if you get bitten by a cat immediately clean the wound. If you get scratched by a cat immediately clean the wound. The next infection is caused by a bacteria named brucella. So brucellosis is caused by this bacteria. A classical symptom of this infection is undulating fever. This is when the fever uh, elevates in temperature and then lowers in temperature, then elevates again and then lowers again. In the image below, I try to show you this rhythmic undulating movement of temperature. This is classical of brucellosis. Prevention of brucellosis is through pasteurization of milk. This bacteria is usually transmitted to humans by contacting of animal products such as milk. The next bacterial infection is from rickettsia. So this one will cause Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This one is given to you from the bite of a tick. 
prevention of Rocky Mountain spotted fever is to av avoid the tick and the bite from a tick. Table 18.10 summarizes the three uh, infections that cause non-hemorrhagic fever. We will now talk about some protozoans and how they can infect the cardiovascular system or the lymphatic system. The only protozoa that we will talk about that affects the cardiovascular system is a protozoa that causes Chagas disease. Trypanosoma is a protozoa that moves via a flagella and it can cause Chagas disease. Chagas disease is the American trypanosomiasis. It is a long in incubation time and it is very difficult to cure. It is seen in the Americas but Central and South America. Transmission of this disease, Chagas disease, occurs through the bite of a kissing bug. So Triatoma is the genus for this kissing bug. It loves to feed on the blood vessels that are in your lips so it will bite you on the soft tissue of the lips. It feeds and then it will defecate. When the subject scratches the wound they will spread the feces into the open wound. Therefore you will introduce trypanosoma cruzi into your bloodstream. The feeding stage of this protozoan is a tripomastigoite. In the image, I have a star over the trypanosoma cruzi that is in its feeding state. Tripomastigoites will penetrate blood or muscle cells and develop into non flagellated a mastigoite. In the picture, the arrow is pointing to a a mastigoite that is non flagellated. Once the blood cell is infected with the non flagellated form, the a mastigoite, it will then rupture the red blood cell releasing large numbers of trypanosomes into the bloodstream. Those released trypanosomes will then cause the classical symptoms of the um, Chagas disease. In this slide, we are showing you the life cycle of trypanosoma cruzi. Table 18.1 summarizes the Chagas disease. This last slide summarizes a few examples of organisms, microbes that affect the lymphatics and the cardiovascular system.